All right. Uh, welcome all to, I think this is our third seminar series, seminar in our series that are called the Bergen Institute Bioeth of Bioethics Seminar Series. I am delighted um, to be able to welcome and introduce uh, Professor Matthew Liao, who he is the Arthur Zitrin Professor of Bioethics, Director of the Center for Bioethics, Professor of Global Public Health, and Affiliated Professor in the Department of Philosophy at New York University. He's the author or editor of Ethics of Artificial Intelligence, The Right to be Loved, Moral Brains, The Neuroscience of Morality, the Philosophical Foundations of Human Rights, Current Controversies in Bioethics, and over 70 articles in philosophy and bioethics. He's given TED and TEDx talks in New York and CERN, Switzerland, and has been featured in a range of media outlets that you would recognize, including the New York Times and the Atlantic. He's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Moral Philosophy uh, and a a peer-reviewed International Journal of Moral, Political, and Legal Philosophy, and importantly, he is an alum of the Greenwall Fellowship Program in Bioethics and Health Policy here at Huskins. So we're delighted to welcome you home. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Mayer. Thank you, Jason. Uh, is this working? Yep. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for the warm welcome, Deborah. And it's really nice to be back. I was an alum from 2004 to 2006 and, uh, and be, have been back, you know, several times since, but it's been a while. So it's really nice to be back here again. Uh, so without further ado, so today I'm talking about AI and ethics uh, towards a robust uh, normative framework. So AI, as we know, is uh, becoming more and more capable. So here's Lee Sedone, the 18-time world champion uh, of the easy-to-learn but very difficult-to-master game of Go. And in 2016, uh, Google DeepMind created something called AlphaGo, which learned to play Go uh, by playing against itself. And it was able to beat this uh, world champion uh, four times out of five uh, and something that experts just didn't think was going to happen uh, anytime soon. In healthcare, AI has begun to identify some cancer better than doctors, diagnose various eye diseases as well as uh, ophthalmologists, and identify viable embryos as fertility specialists do. And recently, an AI uh, well, a gen, uh, an AI gener generated artwork won a first place in an art contest, raising questions about what counts as art and creativity. And this is uh, Blake Lemoyne. He, is a so he was a software engineer at Google, and he claimed that Lambda, which is sort of a pr uh, predecessor of ChatGPT, uh, is sentient and has feelings and is self-aware. And we all know all know about ChatGPT and its ability to write codes, music, poems, and even college essays. So at NYU, we're grappling with you know uh, students, you know, sort of how to deal with students using ChatGPT for writing their assignments. And as AI technologies continue to advance, questions about uh, the ethics of AI uh, become more pressing than ever. So, for example, in an emergency, should a self-driving car prioritize uh, the lives of the passengers or the lives of the pedestrians? Should we as a society allow uh, uh, or uh, ban uh, lethal autonomous weapons that can find and destroy targets without human intervention? So these autonomous weapons, they're already being used in Ukraine uh, and in a bunch of other wars. Uh, how can we create an AI system that is fair and that does not inadvertently discriminate, like this one, against racial minorities? So if you look at, for example, the picture on the right, uh, the, uh, you know, the person on the uh, sort of James Rivelli, he had, you know, d uh, domestic violence, aggravated assault, grand uh, theft, and he subsequently had another grand theft, but he was categorized as low risk, right? And then the, the, uh, Robert Cannon, uh, he just had one petty theft and didn't have any uh, subsequent offenses, but he was categorized as sort of medium risk. Uh, so, you know, how can we improve these type of systems? So my goal today is to try to come up with an ethical framework uh, that can help us through some of these thorny issues. And as we're going to see, it's going to be helpful to distinguish between what I call ethical issues that arise because current AI systems are limited in certain ways, 
um, what I call vulnerabilities in machine learning um, and ethical issues that arise because current AI systems may be working too well and human beings are vulnerable when interact interacting with these systems, what I call human vulnerabilities. <clears throat> so before we do that, let, let me first uh, off by saying a bit about what AI is. There's no re uh, real agreed upon definition of AI. Uh, for our purpose, we can take it to mean something like getting machines to do things that require thinking, learning, and problem solving. And AI can take many different forms. So there's something called uh, sim uh, symbolic AI. Uh, this is the old fashioned AI, which uses a series of if then rules and statements to establish the relationship between the inputs and the outputs. Another form of AI is machine learning, which uses algorithms to learn from data without being explicitly uh, told what to do. And that's the main driver of today's technology. So within machine learning, we can distinguish between something called supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So supervised learning is uh, very quickly uh, where uh, an algorithm is trained on data sets that are labeled, uh, and then it applies what has, it has learned to sort of new data sets. In unsupervised learning, the correct answers have not been labeled, and the algorithm just uh, it can sort the thing on its own. And in reinforcement learning, the agent attempts to learn through trial and error, and the algorithm rewards an agent in a computer sense way if it succeeds and punishes it if, if it fails. Um, and then these methods can be combined with deep learning, which uses uh, different layers of nodes to detect increasingly abstract features. Uh, and deep learning is uh, what's being used for many of the break, uh, breakthroughs in today's technologies. Okay. So let me talk a bit about some of the vulnerabilities uh, in machine learning. So as impressive as machine learning is, it also suffers a number of limitations which can give rise to a host of ethical issues. So first, um, machine learning needs a lot of data to work well. And so what that means is companies have a really strong incentive to harvest or buy data, including sensitive personal data, even when doing so could violate an individual's right to privacy. So an example of this is when the NIH, uh, the NHS in the UK gave the personal data of about 1.6 million uh, patients to Google uh, to test a novel way of detecting kidney injuries. But the problem was they didn't properly tell uh, the patients about how their health data uh, was going to be used. Another problem is that the machine learning is only as good as the data from which it learns. So if a machine learning is trained on inadequate or bad data, then the algorithm is going to ma make bad predictions. So this is known as the garbage in, garbage out problem. So for instance, an algorithm that's trained on gender imbalance medical imaging data sets have been found to do worse at reading uh, chest x-rays for women. Third, if the algorithm itself is bad, it's also gonna make bad predictions. So an algorithm, for example, might identify a pattern even when there isn't one. So this is called underfitting, uh, I mean, overfitting. Uh, and it may fail to identify a pattern even when there is one, this is called underfitting. Um, and they can have, uh, these faulty algorithms can have serious ethical implications. So just to give an example, there was this algorithm that was used in uh, a number of U.S. hospitals for many, many years uh, to determine which patient should, should get extra care. And it was found to discriminate against uh, uh, people of color because it used health costs as a proxy for health needs. And because of structural inequalities, uh, uh, black patients, for example, often spend a lot less on healthcare than uh, uh, equally sick white patients. And as a result, the algorithm falsely concluded that these black patients were healthier than equally white, uh, sick white patients. Now, fourth, deep learning can uh, typically employs uh, thousands or even millions of connections that interact with one another in very complex ways. So as a result, it's very difficult to kind of know what's going on uh, under the hood. And so the black box nature of deep learning raises questions of things like explainability and trust. Uh, for example, a deep learning uh, algorithm may tell you that hey, someone's likely to commit another crime, but it's not gonna be able to tell you why. 
Uh, and since it's a black box, you don't know whether uh, whatever it's saying is, you know, it's saying it on reasonable and, you know, uh, reliable grounds. And so given that, it's also very difficult to trust such a system. And so for high stake decisions, such as, you know, decisions in healthcare or whether to keep someone in jail, not being able to trust a deep learning system is especially uh, worrisome. So are there ways to address or mitigate uh, these, uh, you know, this black box problem? So some researchers are actually trying to do something called interpretable machine learning, which is to add another layer after the black box to try to use that, uh, you know, uh, it's like a technical fix to try to interpret what's going on in the black box. Um, and the uh, additional layer is supposed to, you know, sort of tell you what exactly are the salient things that's happening inside the, the black box. And, um, and the hope is that this would make the black box more interpretable. But I think there are a number of problems with this issue. And uh, one is that, you know, since this is pl placed outside the black box, uh, the additional layer is providing a kind of post hoc, you know, afterward explanation of what's going on in the black box. So you might wonder whether this post hoc explanation is really giving us the, the actual reasons for, you know, why the black box is making the prediction that it did. And so the concern, you can kind of put in a form of a dilemma. So either it's giving us the prediction, you know, it's like it's exactly sort of telling us what's going on inside the black box, in which case, why do you need the black box in the first place, right? Uh, but more likely, I think, is like it's not doing, it's not sort of, it's not completely uh, predicting what's going on inside the uh, black box, in which case, uh, you know, you might wonder, well, what, you know, like, well, this thing is not really, you're just creating, you know, more things, but it's not really explaining what's going on. Um, and so uh, in either case, you're gonna, you know, like sort of, you still have issues with explainability. Um, so other people have said, well, maybe what we should care more about is accuracy rather than interpretability, especially in case in places like medicine. Right. So, uh, you know, some people say that clinicians uh, also prescribe medications without really understanding how medications work. Uh, so, for example, aspirin has been prescribed for nearly a century without under our understanding the mechanism through which it works. Now, but the, 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 this point that like while we may not fully understand how medications work in many cases, arguably we have some ideas of the causal mechanisms through which they work. So. Uh, for, ex for example, people knew something uh, uh, that something from a willow causes fevers and pains to uh, pain to be reduced, even if they did not know anything about salicylic acid, an active ingredient in the production of aspirin. And this contrasts with machine learning, which works through associations and is at now, at, at least for now, unable to track causal relationships. And to see why this matter, it's helpful to point out that machine learning is actually vulnerable to a number of what's called adversarial attacks. So here's an example. Uh, this is a one pixel attack. So researchers have found that, you know, just by taking one pixel in an image, they can get an algorithm to classify an image, uh, for example, an image of a ship as a car with 99% uh, percent, uh, confidence. Um, or in another study, researchers made a 0.04% change to the pixel value in an image. So about 400 pixels out of a, mil, uh, a million. And, you know, for, from our eyes, like, you know, it's a panda before. This is 0 0.007, even uh, fewer ch uh, changes. It's like a panda before and a panda afterwards. Um, but nevertheless, the deep neural uh, network classified a panda as a gibbon with 99.3% confidence. And they've actually found this sort of uh, in sort of, uh, uh, there's some sort of natural adversarial attacks. So for example, if you take a stop sign and you put a banana peel on the stop sign, the, you know, the self-driving car will stop recognizing the stop sign as a stop sign. And that's a big problem if you're gonna rely on self-driving, like, you know, self-driving cars to drive you around. Um, and they've been able to show that this happens also in medical imaging. Uh, so this is just where they do the same adversarial attack and they were able to kind of confuse the algorithm. It classifies the, the sort of, you know, something that wasn't a cancer uh, as cancer and vice versa. Um, and so in some, given all the ways that machine learning uh, could fail, it's critical that companies and AI researchers have an et appropriate ethical framework that they can follow when developing these technologies. 
Okay, so let me talk a bit about human vulnerabilities. So this is when, again, when machines uh, are working too well and humans are vulnerable. So here's, uh, let's start with some examples. So uh, facial recognition technologies are getting better and better. On the plus side, they can help us find criminals uh, more quickly and identify children who are missing or kidnapped. But on the negative side, a government could use this technology to monitor its citizens or profile and discriminate against members of the minority group. Um, so, uh, so, for instance, here's a controversial study from Stanford that allegedly found that uh, you can use machine learning to uh, distinguish sort of between gay and straight, uh, straight sexual orientation, 81% uh, of the time for men and 74% of the time for women, just by looking at their photos. So you can imagine a government that criminalizes homosexuality could use such facial recognition technology to identify and discriminate against homosexuals. And so for our purpose, this is an example where machine learning may be working too well and ethical issues arise because people may be tempted to use uh, it for ill. Uh, second, deep fakes are coming. So here's one of Tom Cruise. Uh, let, let me just... Okay, so that's not Tom Cruise. That's the guy on the left. Um, and, but it, it looks like Tom Cruise. It sounds like Tom Cruise. Uh, and in the future, it's going to be even more difficult to figure out uh, which whether a video is fake. What if someone uses deep fakes to uh, conduct smear campaigns against politicians? That's already actually happening in private citizens and to spread fake news and erode trust in our already very polarized society. Um, so here's another example. So a study from McKinsey predicted that by 2030, 30% 30 of human labor could be replaced by automation. So how do we uh, help people who are gonna lose their jobs because of robots? So when talking about um, AI ethics today, many people begin to think about fairness and bias. And I think these are really, really important issues. But these issues tend to come up because current AI systems are limited in certain ways. And I think we need to, uh, I think it's important to recognize that there are other ethical issues besides fairness and bias. So take deep fake technologies, for example. The concern that they could undermine a democracy is more than just about uh, fairness and bias. So we need sort of a more general approach to thinking about ethics of AI. Um, so in recent years, a great number of ethical frameworks have been proposed. So to date, there are over 80 such frameworks from private companies, government agencies, academic research institutions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and many, a number of these frameworks have uh, uh, recommendations in common. So many draw on the four principles of biomedical ethics, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Uh, and so the idea here is, you know, autonomy seeks to ensure that users are fully informed of and understand the risks and benefits of a particular AI technology and voluntarily consents, uh, consent to it. Beneficence would guarantee that AI applications promote the well-being of users and that of society as a whole. Non-maleficence strives to ensure that AI technologies do, do not impose and do harm on users. And justice seeks to promote the fair and equitable distributions of the benefits and burdens of AI technologies for everybody. And in addition to these four principles, other people have uh, suggested things like transparency, explainability, trust, uh, given that some forms of AI are not easily understood uh, easily, if at all, even by people who program them. Uh, at the same time, many organizations have offered their own distinct recommendations. So here's an example from the Future of Life Institute. It lists uh, a bunch of things, but uh, it lists, for example, value alignment. And with that says that, and I quote, highly autonomous AI systems should be designed so that their goals and behaviors are aligned with human values. And there are a lot of people talking about uh, 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 AI alignment right now in the AI uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of you know in that community. Um, or Microsoft recommends inclusiveness, according to which AI systems should empower everyone and engage people. 
So in one sense, it's uh, it's really great, I think, that these organizations were concerned enough with ethical design and use of AI to put forward these frameworks and principles. But in another sense, however, the proliferation of all these frameworks have created confusion from which uh, you know, pressing questions arise. How were these particular sets of recommendations developed and not others? Which recommendations should AI developers and organizations follow and why? More fundamentally, what grounds and justifies these recommendations? How do we distinguish between recommendations that are genuine ethical principles from those that aren't? Uh, how do you, and importantly, how do we use these uh, recommendations in practice? So it, it seems reasonable that we shouldn't harm subjects, but how do you actually achieve this? Or it seems reasonable that we should be able to trust an AI system, but how do we decide which AI systems to trust? Okay. And unfortunately, most of these AI frameworks don't say uh, anything about those questions. And as a result, they've been criticized uh, for, uh, for offering abstract, high-level principles that in practice have provided very few uh, concrete guidance. And so some people have expressed the concern that these frameworks are merely forms of ethics washing and virtue signaling, where organizations are exaggerating their interest in the ethics of AI as a public relations exercise and maybe to forestall governmental uh, regulation. So I think we, therefore, we need an AI ethics framework that's grounded in substantive normative theory. One can, you know, help us guide these questions. So elsewhere, I've argued that human beings have what, uh, human rights to what I call the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. So let me say a bit about that and how we can use this framework in this context. So as I see it, a good life is one where you're spent uh, pursuing basic activities such as uh, having deep personal relationships with your partner, friends, uh, uh, parents, children, knowledge of the workings of the world, of yourself, of others, active pleasure such as creative work and play, and passive pleasure such as appreciating beauty. And from the basic activities, there are a bunch of fundamental, what I call fundamental conditions. These are various goods, capacities, and options that human beings, qua human beings need uh, in order to do these things, right? So fundamental goods are resources that human beings need in order to sustain themselves corporally, things like food, water, and air. The fundamental capacities are things that uh, are things like the capacity to think, to be able to be motivated by facts, to know and choose and act freely. So this is liberty, to appreciate the worth of something, to develop interpersonal relationships, and to have the control of the direction of one's life, so autonomy. And the fundamental options are sort of the social institutions that are needed so that you can pursue these basic activities. Um, and just very quickly, I think these fundamental conditions are uh, a ground human rights because having these fundamental conditions is of fundamental importance to human beings. And because rights can offer very powerful protections for uh, uh, those who have them. So the former is true uh, because if anything is of fundamental importance to human beings, then pursuing a characteristically good human life is. And it seems clear that if we care about the certain import, uh, the uh, you know certain uh, end, we should attach this importance to the essential means to this particular end. Um, that rights can offer very powerful protection to those who possess them is well known. Uh, so by their nature, rights can um, secure the interests of the rights holders by requiring others, um, the duty bearers, to perform serv certain services without uh, them sort of requesting it. Um, in addition, uh, you know, rights also prevent you, uh, your, uh, you know, interests that ground rights from being part of a first order utilitarian calculus. Um, and so uh, for a bunch of these reasons, I think, uh, you know, because of the importance of the fundamental conditions and because of the importance of rights, this gives us some reasons for thinking that human beings have these human rights. Okay, so how do we apply this? So I think this approach can explain why many of the recommendations found in various AI ethics frameworks are genuine ethical principles. So just take autonomy and respect, uh, which requires that users be fully informed of and understand the risks and benefits of a, of a particular AI application. Well, as noted earlier, autonomy understood as being able to control the direction of one's life is one of the fundamental conditions. And to be able to control the direction of one's life, you need to be informed of and understand the risks and benefits of a particular AI application and the use and one's use of this technology needs to be voluntary. So I think this fundamental conditions approach can uh, therefore implies that users have a right to 
have sufficient information and the time to decide whether to use certain AI applications and a right to make that decision without being coerced or exploited. At the same time, I think this fundamental conditions approach would also exclude some recommendations as genuine ethical principles. So take the value alignment, uh, which again says that highly autonomous AI systems should be designed so that they are aligned with human values. Now, many people rec uh, uh, endorse this re recommendation because they are concerned that AI is going to soon outpace humans and they want to ensure that algorithms are designed so that they won't harm humanity. Now, I, I think while this is a laudable goal, it's not clear that AI systems should be designed so that they're uh, aligned with human values, given that human values vary quite widely and only some of them are good. So, you know, while some people would regard Mother Teresa as being uh, a moral exemplar, there are other uh, people who think that autocratic dictators and races are more exemplars. And we wouldn't want an AI system that is designed so their, their goals and behaviors are aligned with those people who prefer autocrats and races. So a more plausible principle in the vicinity is that AI systems should be designed so that their goals respect uh, persons and humanity as ends in themselves. So sort of kind of like the Kantian idea. And if that were the case, I think the fundamental conditions approach can explain why that would be a genuine ethical principle, right? Given, uh, so having our moral status respected as persons is a fundamental condition for pursuing a basic, uh, for pursuing basic activities, right? Indeed, if our moral status as persons were not respected, then others would uh, be at liberty to use us as mere means to their ends. And we wouldn't have the kind of control necessary to be able to determine the direction of our lives. And there are other reasons why we should adopt a human rights framework. First, respecting human rights is compulsory. It's not something that you can choose uh, not to do. Uh, second, human rights are rights against everybody. And so this means that governments, corporations, individual researchers all have the responsibility to make sure that AI technologies do not violate human rights. And so to illustrate a practical application of this, say that a user has signed an informed consent form or an end, li uh, end user license agreement, giving us permission to use uh, their data. Does this mean that we can now use, do whatever we, we want with the user's data as long as it's within the terms of the agreement? So on this view, the answer is no. Uh, the human rights perspective says that we still have the responsibility to make sure that we do not use the user's data in ways that could undermine their human rights. And there are some interesting applications there in the case of privacy and so on. Third, the human rights framework helps us to see which values are in conflict. So take mass uh, surveillance uh, using facial recognition technologies. So we can see the conflict here is, you know, between law and order on the one hand and our human right to privacy. And the question for us is whether law and order should always trump the right to privacy. And I think there are reasons to doubt this. So say in the future, you can uh, implant biometric devices that can track uh, everybody's movements, possibly even their thoughts. Uh, Nita Farani has a really good book called Battle Your Brain that's been talking about this. And so if law and order always trump uh, trumps the, uh, uh, the right to privacy, it seems that it would be permissible to require citizens to have such implants. But that seems like an overreach. So there are circumstances where law and order doesn't trump the right to privacy. So what does the human rights framework tell us what we should do in practice uh, uh, to govern AI? And I, here, I think, uh, you, uh, you know, I'm really, I really like, uh, this is something that I'm currently developing, but I really think that the biomedical model, bioethics, and the, uh, the can really offer a lot in this particular er uh, uh, area. So one suggestion may be IRBs. So IRBs have worked really well in drug development uh, and, uh, um, and, and bioethics. Maybe something like this can work in the algorithm context. I think this is a better analogy than, say, nuclear, you know, uh, sort of analogy, because, uh, uh, you know, some people think that AI is going to destroy the world. And so it's more like nuclear technologies. But there are a lot of AI, you know, sort of like technologies that are uh, lower risk. Right. Um, and so I think we need to be able to distinguish those. And I think in uh, medicine, there are some applications are higher risk than others. Right. And so I think it, it provides a more nuanced uh, way of thinking about this particular problem. Uh, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A. Now, 
Uh, let me say a bit more. So as we have seen, a pressing problem with current uh, iterations of deep learning is that their learning is in some sense superficial. That is, they do not learn about the real features of the world, such as causal relations or you know, what a panda really is. Um, and as such, deep learning is prone to getting things seriously wrong, uh, as its vulnerability to adversarial attacks suggests. So to reduce the risk of algorithms uh, doing bad things, I, I think we have two options. The first option is to hold the algorithms uh, fixed so that they would give the same results whenever they are provided with the same data, same inputs, um, or, or as the FDA puts it, to use something called locked al algorithms. By way of contrast, uh, adaptive algorithms are able to learn continuously, which means that for a given set of inputs, the outputs may change as the learning process is updated. Now, the second uh, option is to hold the environment in which the algorithm uh, uh, is operate uh, fixed and allow for the use of adaptive algorithms. So take, for example, next generation robotic surgeons. Say you want to use adaptive algorithms in such a robotic surgeon. You may be able to reduce the risk of algorithms going astray by holding the environment in which they operate fixed. So maybe you can do this, for example, by allowing a robotic surgeon only to perform tasks that it can do with a high degree of accuracy, such as incisions or suturing. Uh, but the problem is that in many healthcare applications, it may be quite difficult to hold the environment uh, in which the algorithms operate uh, fixed, since many such applications involve the human organism, the light processes of which are in constant flux, and therefore difficult to hold fixed. So given that, it seems that you might think, well, the first option, locking the algorithm itself, may be preferable for many types of healthcare research in the near term. But even though, so I think there are reasons uh, to use locked algorithms, at least initially, but even though we should do this, I think we can still take advantage of adaptive algorithms to what might be what I call staggered learning. So staggered learning involves allowing adaptive algorithms to learn and generate new input and output relations, but not to apply that new learning uh, uh, synchronous, uh, uh, synchronously. Right. So once the new connections between inputs and outputs have been verified and validated, maybe through some sort of randomized control trials, then they could be uh, uh, used to develop a new uh, updated locked algorithm. So you can sort of have the locked algorithms operating and at the same time have the al adaptive algorithm running as well. And they'll be collecting data for the next, you know, so the next generation or the next model, the next version. And in this way, learning could still occur, but it would be done in steps. So uh, let me just conclude. Uh, new AI technologies can be really exciting, but they can also raise a number of ethical issues. Uh, whenever we're developing new technologies, we should not just ask whether we can, but also whether we should bring them about. Uh, I propose that the human rights framework can serve as a baseline from which we can make these important decisions that can affect all of our lives. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Uh, do we have we have about twenty minutes for questions? No questions. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much. Oh, you, wait for that. You get a minute. Just a second. Hi, thank you so much for that talk, that was great. Um, could you say a little bit more about how the human rights framework can respond to um, the instances of, of racism that we've seen um, in algorithms? You, you pointed to a couple of examples, so can you just elaborate a little bit more about how human rights can address, can address issues of racism we see being um, exacerbated by yeah. algorithms? That, that's a great question. So I take it we have a human right not to be discriminated, right? And so the human rights framework, you might think, uh, and whether uh, sort of intentionally or inadvertently, a lot of the, uh, sometimes the algorithm could be doing it intentionally, and certainly that would be prohibited, you know, sort of uh, on the human rights framework. But a lot of times, uh, uh, what's happening in the AI uh, area is that the data that's being collected is not representative. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it's not intentional, but we should, we are, we rec we know that is a problem. And so this is something that we should be actively trying to make sure that our uh, sort of the data is representative. Um, and so that's a way where, um, you know, you think, look, there are people that, uh, you know, so there's an ethical value here, 
uh, people are equal, uh, have equal moral status as persons. And this is a reason to make sure that these data are representative. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, so my question was about, um, you talked about having blocked algorithms with adaptive algorithms in the background mm -hmm. and then like checking them for implementing them, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so I have like, uh, Two questions. Um, the first is like, do you think that will help address data drift still, or will data drift still be a problem? Um, and the second is, uh, do you think that, uh, like, does your framework take in a, into account problems with the data that is already collected? Like, um, sometimes the data that's available um, is not fully representative. Like. I think that they're finding ways to address this now, but um, like some random control trials exclude over like 90% of the people that um, they're trying to actually represent in the trials. So I was just wondering how your framework handles um, these things. Yeah, can you say a bit more about data drift? Like just so to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah. About what? Uh, data drift. Oh, um, so like you might imagine an algorithm is getting the right, is accurate and reliable when you first start using it. Oh, I see. But over time, then something either in the patient population changes or the environment, maybe you get, maybe originally you mostly had like young patients and was trained on that. And then over time you have older patients and the associations that made were correct for the young patients, but not the new patient population. Mm. So it's inaccurate now. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. So I think that's where uh, um, the the stepwise, the stagger learning, I think could be really helpful, right? Because uh, right now they're just letting it train and it's, uh, they have no idea what's driving what, right? And so a lot of times it, wor uh, it works, but when it goes badly, they don't know why. Right. And so the idea is, uh, so the thought is, you know, maybe what we should do is have locked algorithms to randomize control trial, for example, like there may be there are other types of thing, but you know, randomized control trials is the gold standard, right? So you can do that. And now we kind of, uh, because that helps uh, you, helps us understand the causal relations, right? Um, and so now we know this particular thing works and then we can try to, uh, you know, like uh, add more data to it. And then we again do the randomized control trial, and we find that, for example, there's data drift. Then we know that okay, we're added. We've we've just added something. It's kind of confusing the thing. So what's going on here? And then we maybe we need to go in. Maybe the data is unrepresentative. So we need to go in and collect. You know, maybe it was incomplete. We need to collect. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe this different population requires certain other types of training. You know, like other types of data that's not there. Um, and in that way, we can kind of put things together. And this is this is a bit more so it's stagger learning, but I think it's more res, uh, it's more responsible because we're talking about patients here, and we're going to be using these things. And so realistically, um, if we want to use this in healthcare applications, we really need to know, like, have a really good sense of how it's working, right? Not just it's not it can't just be associative it, uh, according to this picture that I'm trying to paint. Yeah. Um, and I forgot your second question already. Uh, can you uh, say that one more time? Oh yeah, um, just um, if it has any way to take into account um, like problems of um, sometimes the data will have problems where uh, like the trials is based on um, in addition to like racial or gender disparities, it could also just be that, you know, maybe they targeted um, the exclusion and inclusion criteria can yeah. sometimes be too extreme and exclude over like 90% of the people they're trying yeah. to target. Yeah, okay. uh, that's great. And so that's what I call sort of vulnerabilities in machine learning. A lot of those, those problem, a lot of that is, you know, people, they're just not getting the right kind of data. And so because they're not getting the right kind of data, they're getting the wrong types of results. Um, but I want, yeah, and, and I wanted to distinguish that, that from when the machine learning is doing too well, right? And that's a different set of problems. And so that's a distinction that's not quite made in the literature. I think a lot of the time we kind of conflate the two, but they're very different problems. And I think I find it helpful to kind of keep them distinct, you know, to recognize that there, there are different sources of problems there. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Sita Prabhu. Um, thank you so much for presenting today. I really enjoyed learning a lot from your lecture today. Um, I'm very curious to hear your uh, perspective on the following. So 
Often there is opposition to the usage of the human rights framework or criticisms where there lies a basis that we cannot apply the human rights framework with AI technology because um, AI is lacking the human capacity or like AI in colloquial terms is not human, right. even though there's very much human or humans behind the usage of AI. Similar colloquial language is like the argument of corporation are people, not people, so we remove them from responsibility. So how do we respond to that criticism um, that wants to oppose the usage of human rights framework? Oh, that's such a great question. So I think, um, you know, at least right now, all the AI technologies like human beings need to be in the loop. They are in the loop or they they need to be in the loop. And so uh, I, I think an advantage of the human rights framework is, is we see that actually the we're responsible, right? And so it kind of makes that more salient and sort of say, you can't just sort of hide behind, oh, this is just data. I'm just letting the algorithms run and, you know, um, because we're actually deploying them, we're using them in self-driving cars, we're using them in medicine already, and these are uh, this is sort of impacting people's well-being, and so um, and uh, and so I think that um, I think we just have to make clear that uh, so you know like one thing would be it's it's an issue of, of, of accountability. So the the way to say it is to say that. Uh, you know, but people are de de developing these technologies and they have a responsibility if they can foresee, right? So in ethics, there's idea that if you know something's going to happen and it could have these harmful effects, then you can be held responsible for these type of, um, you know, for, for what happens when it goes wrong. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. My question is more along the lines of deploying AI under conditions where we don't really know the answer. So for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were many algorithms that were used and tested on patients in real time as they were experiencing COVID in the hospital. And at that point, you don't really have enough information as humans and the way in which to move forward can be a little bit polarizing. and an algorithm can be helpful in terms of predicting and anticipating outcomes for patients. So how does the standard learning approach apply to settings like that where we actually don't know what's moving forward and there is no clear consensus on what we should do as professionals? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And there are a lot of experts. Uh, I see Mariah here, sort of, a lot, uh, and Ruth here, a, a lot of experts in the sort of research ethics in this area. And I take it the problem there is sort of, um, um, I, you know, distinguish between emergency situations versus sort of ordinary situations. And in emergency situations, what are we allowed to do? You know, so given the pandemic, you know, there are all these people dying. Uh, can trials be a bit riskier, right? Can we do challenge trials, for example, and things like that? People are asking those questions that we, you, you might think ordinarily we wouldn't do that, you know, under uh, you know, yeah, uh, you know, under normal circumstances, but because of the, because people are dying, we don't really know what's going on. Maybe you were allowed to be, you know, try more uh, sort of riskier things in order to like help people. Um, and so, uh, and so maybe under that context, some of the AIs, you could kind of justify sort of using something that's a bit riskier. Uh, but I think that um, at some point we need to, uh, you know, when things are back to more normalized situation, hopefully like now, uh, we need to go back to sort of our regular research ethics where, uh, uh, a lot of these need to go through randomized control trials. They need to. We need to make sure that uh, the risks uh, don't outweigh the, you know, the benefits and so on and so forth, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. I have a question about you referenced at one point the AI ethics frameworks that various organizations and corporations mm. put out, um, and you brought up the worry that some of those read like PR projects. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned, for instance, that like human values as something on the list of like ethical priorities is really underdescribed theoretically because humans disagree about things. Like it isn't even clear that like the statistical mean of human values is even something that we should like pursue. Like there are a lot of unanswered theoretical questions there. I had another a related question. Mm -hmm. 
about these frameworks. So even if they use theoretically robust mm -hmm. values, so for mm -hmm. instance, if they list like autonomy and mm -hmm. beneficence, mm -hmm. there are places where those things conflict. And you mentioned that, um, like cases where well-being, well-being and autonomy is a really fraught mm -hmm. axis. So yeah. I'm wondering how you see the human rights framework as helping us see which rights are in conflict and how we resolve those. Could you say more about that? Yeah, that's wow. That's a really tough question. So uh, the conflicts of rights or conflicts of uh, claims is sort of it's something that uh, ethicists have been grappling with moral dilemmas. Right. And so and that also applies in the case of conflicts of rights. Uh, and I think that um, as a society, we try to figure out what, where that right balance is and different societies may come up with different answers to that question. Some people might be more say, you know, we need to give more to autonomy. Some people might be more paternalist. They can say we need to reduce the autonomy and sort of like make sure that people's welfare uh, is promoted. Um, and so I think that that's where th that's. Uh, that gets into the realm of practical ethics. And my own view there is we need community engagement. You need to talk to the people. You need to talk to the people who are uh, sort of like the stakeholders, you know, and, you know, when you're trying to apply particular principles, uh, different communities will decide where the point should be, right? Where the cutoff should be. And we need to engage and sort of, and I, I, that's why we live in a democracy. So assuming also democracy, we, we get to kind of, uh, uh, assuming a functioning uh, democracy, then we can hopefully identify some reasonable point where even if they're reasonable disagreements, so people, you know, some people are going to say, no, it should be like the libertarians might think, no, you know, there shouldn't be, uh, you know, like don't have mass mandates or don't, you know, sort of uh, require uh, vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. But we as a society might sort of decide, no, it should, you know, be closer to this particular uh, um, uh, point, given the, you know, the, the emergency situation, you know, with respect to COVID, for example. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, thanks so much for the talk. I am wondering or curious to hear your thoughts on how we have to think about these ethical frameworks and sort of how they apply to sort of the, the different levels of AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Um, and this must be kind of my lack of understanding in this field, but I know that like regression methods are kind of a form of supervised learning, and we've been using these in medicine for decades now, and there's sort of never been any you know, thought about that in machine learning specifically. So I'm just kind of like, well, obviously, there are many levels to this. I'm just kind of curious to get your thoughts about how the ethical work applies sort of across these different levels. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. So I take it the, so like regression has been used, right? Uh, in sort of symbolic AI. So that's a case where, we, you know, we, uh, you know, I mentioned the stuff about if then statements and things like that. And so we can have very sophisticated AI, like most of the machines right now are sort of based on symbolic AI uh, systems and it can be very sophisticated. I take it the, the difference right now is sort of in machine learning, they're kind of, we're also using regret, we're using similar techniques, you know, uh, su support vector machines and all the, you know, like, uh, and, and all these other different things. Uh, but we're uh, allowing the machine, the algorithm to kind of sort the thing on its own, or, you know, like, especially like uh, an obvious example, a uh, more clear example would be unsupervised learning, right? It's kind of just it's doing its own sorting and then it's kind of doing its own outputs, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's something that's different. So the, I think uh, uh, techno, uh, the algorithm is sort of the, what we do is very similar, but I think uh, there's also some differences in, you know, like what we're doing uh, there. And so, um, and they found, they found that rather than hard coding, right? Sort of uh, if you do these type of adaptive learning, you can actually, uh, uh, they were really, you know, sort of like, I think, uh, what, about um, 10, 12 years ago, they found that they could classify all these images without you sort of specifying, you know, what a dog is. Uh, and that was pretty impressive. So, yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you uh, for this talk. Oh, and, and so my question was sort of about how you imagine, I guess, implementing a human rights framework in AI in a world in which human rights aren't really taken seriously in a lot of cases. Yeah. yeah. Here and so and so, I'm thinking from the sense like, are is a suggestion that AI should just developers should just not participate in the prison industrial complex, for instance, where there are often a lot of human rights violations, or if it's improving, there's 
their state a little bit, but their rights are still violent. Right, so I guess, yeah, so, so how do you imagine this working uh, given that human rights just are the structure in which yeah. the system is operating. Yeah, great. So I uh, so uh, as an ethicist, I distinguish between like what's happening and what should be happening, right? So, you know, you might think, you know, in a place where uh, people are getting, you know, people are killing each other, uh, there's still sort of uh, norms like you shouldn't murder, right? Even if they're murdering each other, right? And so the human rights framework is an ethical framework. And so this is like what we, so the idea, the suggestion would be something like, this is what we should be doing. Whether we're do actually doing it or not, that's a different question. And so like, it's, uh, you know, if we're not doing that, then maybe what well, we should be doing that. So that's sort of one answer. And then the other one is, um, the human rights framework has actually been adopted. So if you take the, you know, the Declaration of Human Rights has sort of been adopted by, what, 180 countries. And so uh, at least uh, on paper with these very generalized principles, like people seem happy to go along, like sort of uh, accept something, you know, and that might be, uh, practically speaking, that might be a good way to forward. There's already a lot of that framework. Um, but there's a third thing, which is like, I actually also think that theoretically speaking, there's a lot of benefit to thinking uh, through human rights. I know uh, Professor uh, Fain has written a lot about this topic. And um, the, uh, I think that in contrast to just like a cost benefit analysis, I think uh, the rights language there, there are a lot of, the, you know, it helps us to see who has the claims, who don't, and, you know, and then to be able to distinguish between not just degrees of claims, but different kinds of claims. And I think that can give us a more nuanced picture about what we should be doing, you know, and whether people are actually doing it. I think that gets messy and more difficult. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for this presentation. So I have a question I think sort of follows from Joey's, I'm not entirely sure. It's a practical mm -hmm. How is this supposed to work? Mm -hmm. So there's first the question of which human rights framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not one. But also, you keep reference to gestures higher. Is your image or your sort of vision that somehow there would be some sort of a review mechanism like an IRT <laughs> that private sector AI developers would need to go through? Mm -hmm. Say more about that. Yeah, so I've been, uh, I, I've been, uh, so I run an AI ethics lab at uh, at NYU, and we've been kind of been thinking a lot about AI digital governance uh, and sort of. Um, and this, in this area, there's a question of like, where should the regulation take place? Um, so it could be. Uh, so, you know, it could be very upstream, like you start right from the start, you know, as soon as you start thinking about an algorithm. Or it could be more downstream, where when there's an application, you actually have cars, you know, on the road, and then you can kind of regulate at that level. Um, and the U.S. Uh, tends to be more in favor of downstream regulation because of the the problem with innovation. So we're trying to balance innovation and regulation. Um, and then there's something called the life cycle approach, where you know where you you sort of like at every step, right? You're thinking, you're kind of assessing the risk of um, the technology. And I think that like in medicine, where it's more like a life cycle approach, you're looking at it every every stage. I, I think that uh, for AI technologies, you should also adopt a life cycle approach. And some of the, um, and so you might think, well, that's kind of, uh, so some people might worry about over-regulation, but if you look at the, again, the biomedical model, which I really like, uh, there, uh, so at NYU, for example, if you want to do a survey on people, you have to, you know, fill out an IRB form, you know, like, and so on and so forth. But it's very minimal. It's like, uh, it's it's very easy to do. Uh, they look at it, they say, oh, this is just like on, on Amazon Turk, no problem, go ahead and do it, right? And so it could be as simple as that, uh, but at least there's a level of check to you know make sure that this is not it's like not more than minimal risk and so on and so forth and i think that that's how we need the same kind of oversight there um even if some a lot of times we might just decide this is not there are no ethical issues or very little minimal ethical issues there and so the life cycle approach allows us to kind of uh not lose track of you know the potential harms and stuff like that and to be ready to deal with them in case that they're there so that's sort of this, that's something that we've been trying to develop, uh, um, sort of and articulate. Um, yeah. 
We are at the top of the hour, so please join me in thanking again. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.